I've been seeing a lot of talk about test-driven development, and it basically boils down to two groups of individuals. People who have used it, understand what it is, and keep it in their toolkit for writing software, and another group of people who say they've used it, but obviously haven't, and spend their lives complaining about how it takes twice as long to write software because of TDD. That second group spends most of their time bringing up misconceptions about software methodologies they don't understand, as opposed to just writing useful software. The most common misconception I've seen with TDD is people think you have to write all of your tests up front. At face value, this makes sense. After all, when you write tests after the software is written, you are writing all of those tests at once. That's not how test-driven development works though. You actually want to write one test at a time, seeing the test fail, then making it pass, and then repeating. Let's use a simple leak code problem to walk through this TDD loop. We'll use leak code number 1929, which is concatenation of an array. This problem is essentially joining the same array together to create a new array that is double its original length. So not super complicated, but it'll work really well for getting this example across. The first step is to document the desired behavior by writing a test case. To start out, we can say that given an array with a single element, it should return an array with two elements, both of which are equal to one. With that test case written, we move on to the second step, which is to write code that compiles and fails. Ensuring that your test will fail is important because it ensures you don't write code that will always pass, which would be bad because the test isn't useful if it can never fail. Our failing code is simple, it just returns an empty array. The third step is to write the least amount of code possible to make your test case pass. Oftentimes this isn't the final solution and with this test case, we can simply return an array that contains two values, both of them being one. The fourth step is to refactor the code if possible. Given we only have one test case, there isn't much to refactor, so we can skip this step. The fifth step is to assess if this solution documents all the known behaviors we want to cover. If it does, then we are done. Since this doesn't document all of the behaviors we want to cover, Let's go through this process one more time. The next behavior we'll document is what happens when an array contains two elements. With that behavior documented as a test case, we can now write the minimum code needed to compile and fail. Since our current code returns the same two hard-coded values, this step is already complete for us. You can think of this as us finding a bug in our code and documenting that bug as a test case. Moving on to the third step, we write the minimum amount of code necessary to fix this bug and make the test pass. While there's probably a better solution, it's best to just write the code that you think will satisfy your test case. In this case, we end up looping through the array twice and outputting an array twice as big with the elements duplicated. Now it's time to refactor. While I was working through step three, I realized I could solve this problem with a single loop. After updating the code to that solution, we rerun the tests and observe they're still passing. If this wasn't a YouTube video, I would be inclined to write a few more test cases just to be sure I covered everything, but it is, so I'm going to move on to keep the algorithm happy. If you found this example helpful though, please give the video a like or leave a comment down below letting me know that this TDD example was a game changer. Another misconception is that test room development will take twice as long because you have to write the tests before the code itself. Even ignoring that automated tests are code, this is still a very illogical statement. Software that is going into production should have automated test cases to verify it works as expected. If your software doesn't have test cases, then it's probably a sign it's a hobby project or a throwaway proof of concept. Assuming you're working on software that needs to exist for more than a few weeks and serve more than a few customers, then you're already writing automated tests, which means TDD won't take twice as long. The other issue with this misconception is that TDD will actually make you work faster when it's done right. When you write tests at the end of your project, it is usually more than just writing the tests themselves. Since you didn't build the software with testing in mind, you usually have to do some rework just to make the code easier to test in the first place. When you start with tests first, you're actually building up the testing infrastructure as you go. As soon as you run into an issue with writing a test for your code, you stop what you're doing and you figure out how you can test it. That alone helps you from going down the path of writing software that's impossible to test. Another common complaint I've heard is that you shouldn't write your code for your tests. At face value, this seems completely reasonable. Why would you let your tests dictate how you're going to solve a problem? However, the only tests that are worth writing are the ones that document the behavior of our code. 
This means that our tests are oftentimes the very first consumer of the code that is being written. As software engineers, one of our top priorities should be to write code that is not only easy for others to read, but also easy for others to use. Test room development helps to short circuit bad API design. This is because if we can't write a test for the code we're working on, then how can we expect someone else to incorporate that code into a future project? TDD makes API design incredibly easy. You don't have to worry so much about if you should use an abstract factory or if this calls for a repository or a singleton or any other design pattern. Yeah, you'll end up using those, but oftentimes the most natural solution while letting your tests drive the development end up being the best ones. You can figure out what the design pattern is later and rename the class or function to better reflect that. Something that gets missed all the time when I talk about TDD is how much time people spend on manually testing their work. If you aren't writing tests at the start, then you are probably writing some code, compiling, then testing that code out manually. This can work perfectly fine when you're just learning something new and want to play around and see how something works. For an actual project though, you'll quickly find that running your code manually is tedious, even more so if your code has more than two branches that you would need to test every time you make a change during development. When I use TDD, I find myself spending next to no time manually testing my work. What ends up happening is I spend the bulk of my time going through the red green refactor loop, and once I'm satisfied with the solution, I will deploy my app to an Android device and test it out. Sometimes I get things perfect in the first attempt, and other times I find some bugs during manual testing. When I find those bugs, I document them as a test case and verify the bug exists by the test failing. Then I update my code so the test passes, rerun all the tests I wrote, and if all of them pass, then I know I fixed the bug, and I didn't break anything existing. If I found this bug without having a test in place, I would not only have to fix the bug, I'd also have to manually test everything else I worked on to make sure the bug fix didn't break anything else. The alternative to that is to just not test thoroughly. This may sound like a joke, but it's a viable alternative I've seen others use fairly often, and I'm even guilty of doing this myself at times. Yes, the guy making a video about TDD doesn't always use TDD, go figure. At this point, you might be asking yourself how we would use test room development for front end work or machine learning or data analytics. The great thing about TDD is it's not just for unit testing. If you spend a lot of time with SQL, you can start off with a list of results, build out a test data set, and then query to verify that you get the correct results back. For machine learning, you can start off with an assumption for how the model should work, then write some tests to document the behavior, and then once the behavior is met, then you know your model is doing what it should be doing. For front-end development, you can employ snapshot tests to verify your application is rendering correctly. You can start off with hard-coded values for the snapshot and then replace those hard-coded values with dynamic ones. And as long as the app renders the same, then you know it's working as expected. I do think those options are a little more advanced. And if you're not comfortable with unit testing, then you may struggle with those. If you want to get better at unit testing, then check out this video to learn about how to write unit tests the correct way. If you already write unit tests, but you want to get better, then check out this video about the four common mistakes I've made while writing unit tests. That's it. That's the video.